Good afternoon and welcome to the Cato Institute. I'm David Bowes. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Institute and I want to welcome everybody here and remind you that there are books for sale outside, so don't forget to pick up a book. I always feel silly wearing a suit to introduce people from Reason Magazine, but you know, we have a dress code here we can't necessarily enforce on people who come from outside. Um, I'll tell you, I get up in the morning every day and I look at soaring government spending and poll results and this year's presidential candidates and I get depressed. And then I notice that Nick Gillespie and Matt Welch look at Southwest Airlines and the plastic people of the universe and the new media and they see a future so bright you got to wear shades. So it's probably a healthier perspective on the world. And they have been writing about that perspective in reason for many years, and now, as you know, it's in a book, The Declaration of Independence. And despite the political theme of this book's title, and especially the subtitle, How Libertarian Politics Can Fix What's Wrong with America, this isn't really a book about politics. It's more like how non-politics can fix what's wrong. As I hardly need to tell any of you, Nick Gillespie is the editor-in-chief of Reason.com and Reason TV, and before that he was editor of Reason Magazine. He has a PhD in English literature, which would have seemed embarrassing enough until the Daily Beast named him one of the right's 25 top journalists, so talk about embarrassing. Matt Welch is now editor-in-chief of Reason Magazine. He previously worked at the Los Angeles Times, and during the heady post-communist days of the 1990s, he lived and reported in Central Europe, where lots of interesting things were happening. Tyler Cowan says this book is the up-to-date statement of libertarianism. Well, as the author of Libertarianism, a primer, I'm not quite ready to concede that, <laughs> but I'll let all of you make the decision after you listen to this forum and read the book. So please welcome Nick Gillespie and Matt Welch. Thanks, everybody. I'm Nick Gillespie, and uh, we're uh, as we start this, Matt and I are going to talk and uh, so show some slides and uh, play a little bit of music as well. Um, and essentially, what we're going to do today is talk for about 30 minutes, and we're going to go through the main arguments of the book, which break down into uh, three basic sections. The uh, first one is uh, what we call the end of the world as we know it, which uh, kind of where we lay out the idea that the uh, system that we're living under, the duopoly system of Republicans and Democrats, is morphing into something else that's similar to the sort of individualization and decentralization and democratization process we've been seeing in non-political parts of our lives. Uh, then we have a uh, uh, the uh, second section, uh, which uh, goes by the name of uh, the democratization of just about everything. Uh, goes into some of the case studies of how things have actually been getting better uh, in parts of our lives that are not directly controlled or uh, heavily regulated by politics. And then the uh, third section uh, we call Operationalize It Baby, uh, because uh, we always have to have a baby uh, somewhere uh, in our uh, work, I guess. And that uh, lays out why this time is different and why we actually might be uh, moving into what we like to think of as a libertarian moment. So uh, without further ado, Matt Welch is going to talk a little bit. The, uh, the work of the uh, wonderful Meredith Bragg. I'm going to be looming over Nick's shoulder for uh, much of today, um, just because I feel more comfortable there. Um, as a general rule, things, and to an extent that's uh, rarely appreciated, things are not 
uh, as they seem. Uh, tectonic shifts in the course of human events, in the course of human history, are rarely predicted at the time, even by the people who are doing the uh, heavy shifting. In August of 1989, John Fund, who's known to many of you in this room, happened to meet up with the free market Czech economist Václav Klaus, and he asked him, so do you see uh, the, any good prospects for the East Bloc becoming free and democratic? And Klaus said, not in my lifetime. And uh, by the end of the year, he was the first finance minister of a free Czechoslovakia. Um, in uh, 2007, a Morgan Stanley tra trader named Howard Hubler, I believe, he knew the housing market was going to uh, burst. He knew that you could bet against mortgage-backed securities and make a bundle, but he couldn't imagine the market going down further than 8%, and so as a direct result, lost something like $9 billion. It was the worst single trade in human history. And as this uh, slide here kind of uh, hints at, in uh, 2007, just four years ago, the basic conventional wisdom was that the presidential campaign would come down to a contest between Hillary Clinton and Rudolph Giuliani. Giuliani, uh, in fact, was uh, in the uh, Iowa electronic markets, which I'm sure some of you are busy uh, betting in uh, even as we speak. Uh, he was the front runner in that for all every week except for one in the year 2007. And the electronic markets never once had on their list, even in 2008, a candidate named Ron Paul. Um, and as we all know, Paul crushed Giuliani like a grape. Um, the lesson here and what we talk a lot about in the first third of the book is that revolutionary catastrophic change is always and forever underpriced. It's as if we can't imagine that the world that we live in is capable of changing even 10% or 10 degrees. Um, it's what we talk about a lot as existence bias or status quo bias. Um, people think that the world that we live in, we're condemned to live in it in the future. Uh, in order to uh, see examples of it, uh, we use this as a time frame basically from 1970 to 2010 and not just so that we can mix in as many uh, obscure uh, cultural references from our childhood as humanly possible into the text. Uh, but if you think about every turn of the decade since around 1970 and what fears we were going, we were uh, gripped with and uh, the worlds that we were going to be condemned to live in back then, uh, they've all come falling apart. In 1970, we were going to have endless Southeast Asian war and the military draft and things like wage and price controls and hysterical government overreach. And by the end of the decade, we had no draft, no war, and we were deregulating trucking and airlines and media and beer. Uh, in 1980, we all assumed that it was runaway inflation and a Cold War that would last forever. Um, and by the end of that decade, both of those were pretty much gone as well. 1990, who can forget, <laughs> uh, the Japanese were going to control us uh, for the rest of our lives. It was just a matter of what kind of rent we had to pay in Rockefeller Center. Um, needless to say, that all went away. In 2000, AOL Time Warner, uh, my uh, good uh, pal uh, Robert Shear wrote at the time of that merger, uh, you know, forget the wild zone of libertarian freedom on the internet. It's all corporate, uh, you know, from here on out, baby. Um, common thread here is that we always overvalue the reach and the extent of people who hold power at the given moment. Um, we talk a lot about uh, monopolies and duopolies, which are very instructive. Uh, you see, uh, any of these concentrations of power, by definition, end up treating their customers as captives. And the example that we use in the book is Kodak and Fujifilm. They dominated the uh, market for color film in the world, still do to a lesser extent, but we'll get to that. 80-90% uh, of the market for decades, uh, Kodak had as much as 96% of the market in the United States and was twice the subject of antitrust action from the Department of Justice. Even as recently as the late 1990s, the Clinton administration was saying we have to keep these antitrust protections in place. So what happened to Kodak? Well, it got kicked off the Dow Jones Industrial uh, average uh, in 2004, after seven decades, share price went down from above 40 to below four. It'll probably be a penny stock by the end of the year. Uh, they had tried to continually trade up their customers, get them to buy ever more expensive film that you had to develop 24 to get the one picture that you wanted. And they're completely caught flat-footed by a digital revolution that accrued power to the individual so that you could take your own pictures, develop them as you saw fit. Um, the uh, the, there's an application here to politics. Um, as, uh, as 
people as pol political parties try to treat us as a captive audience, and Nick will talk about more of this in a, uh, a second, the analog top-down model in every aspect of life is coming undone. And the question is, and is the central uh, theme of the book, is how do we take that and apply it into the last places where the uh, dead hand is keeping us down? Thanks. And, uh, yeah, what, uh, as, as happens, say, in the film market or in any number of other business sectors, there's been a, a real melt uh, away from the traditional powerhouse firms in politics. Uh, this is a, a chart from the Pew Research Center a study uh, called about new typologies that came out earlier this year. And you can see in the 2000s in this uh, so far fairly disappointing 21st century, uh, the one thing that we can uh, say is good is that Democrats and Republicans are in weaker positions now than they were at the uh, turn of the century. And if you take those numbers back, if you take those trends back to 1970, you find something even more stunning. According to the Harris poll, which started in uh, 69, 19, or around 1970, uh, tracking how people identified themselves. Do you consider, uh, they asked, do you consider yourself a Republican or a Democrat, regardless of what you're registered as or how you vote regularly? And back in 1970, fully 49% of Americans said they considered themselves Democrats, and about 36% uh, said they considered themselves Republicans, and only about 19 considered themselves independent. If you uh, take those numbers up through uh, the most recent uh, Harris poll findings, it's more like about 33% or so consider themselves Democrats, about 26% consider themselves Republicans, and 28% consider themselves independents. Independents are where the action is, uh, and that's uh, not just where the action is, but also where the power is. Uh, independents, when you look at the way that they've uh, had an impact on recent uh, political uh, swings. Uh, basically, he who controls or she who controls the independence wins the elections. Uh, this is bad news for Barack Obama, who did well with independence when he came into office and has been fading pretty fast since then. Uh, and it's especially true in Congress. Uh, one of the things that uh, we talk a lot about in the book is this fiction that where uh, each election cycle seems to bring in a new permanent governing majority that is going to lock down power in Washington for the foreseeable future. Uh, you know, first it was the Republicans in the early part of this century. Everybody was saying, well, when they picked up seats in 2002, 2004, it was done. The Democrats were going to have to disband and become something totally else. In 2006 and 2008, we were told, no, it's actually the Democrats who are going to be really powerful. And then that got undone in 2010. Um, and there's an interesting twist that's particularly uh, great, I think, for most of the people in this room, which is that there's a huge percentage of the independent vote which is really libertarian, uh, with a small L. Uh, and drawing on work uh, that uh, David Bowes and David Kirby, who uh, I see uh, David Kirby's in the uh, office here, uh, talking about the uh, libertarian vote in the age of Obama and whatnot, uh, they identify about 14% um, uh, of the uh, population as predictably uh, libertarian, meaning essentially, you know, that they're for social tolerance, free trade, uh, you know, the right economic policies along with uh, being anti-drug war, things like that. Uh, and in their work, and uh, David will also, uh, no doubt in the uh, uh, comments section, point out that uh, we actually mistyped uh, one of their results in the book, which we are dutifully uh, revising for the uh, second printing. Uh, hopefully that'll be any day. Uh, we don't know, but... Um, you can see that libertarians are growing as part of the independent electorate and also that most importantly if you look at the libertarian presidential vote uh, something has happened. The libertarians used to always feel uh, for a long time pretty locked into voting for a Republican candidate and that has changed lately where uh, the Republicans need to work for the libertarian vote and the Democrats can grab it if they uh, actually come our way because this is part of what we've been uh, uh, realizing more and more, and this is, uh, we'll get to this in the uh, end of the book, one of the reasons, or in the discussion of the end of the book, one of the reasons why independents are powerful is precisely because they remain independent. They don't get uh, kind of uh, 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 absorbed into the, uh, assimilated into the Borg of either the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. And what we're going to talk about now is how this plays into a uh, more interesting uh, 
kind of political dynamic which we call the democratization of just about everything. Appreciate that uh, David Hasselhoff is wearing an eyeliner as the Berlin Wall is coming down. Um, few people in this room and maybe in uh, the rooms outside would question William F. Buckley's commitment to fighting the idea and practice of international communism. So instead, let's talk a little bit about William F. Buckley as a music critic. In uh, 1964, <laughs> uh, William F. Buckley wrote the following words about the Beatles. And should I do a, a Buckley impersonation? I don't know if I have one. Uh, let me say it as evidence of my final measure of devotion to the truth. The Beatles are not merely awful. I would consider it sacrilegious to say anything less that, than that they are so unbelievably horrible, so appallingly unmusical, so dogmatically insensitive to the magic of the art, that they qualify as crowned heads of anti-music even as the imposter popes went down in history as anti-popes. Uh, fast forward two decades later, there's another uh, and, uh, Cold War hawk who was known as that before he became an environmental alarmist, Al Gore. Uh, Al and his wife, Tipper, famously launched a jihad, before we use that as a metaphor, uh, about the Satanism and sexuality of popular music, urging similarly concerned parents to petition the FCC to suspend the licenses of people who played such horrible music as Twisted Sisters, We're Not Gonna Take It, and Cindy Lauper's, Cindy Lauper's uh, She Bop, which uh, in case anyone was wondering why, it's because it was about masturbation. Um, uh, at people of a certain age might remember that uh, Frank Zappa was hauled up in Congress and gave a, uh, a festive uh, rebuke to all of that. But it wasn't just Frank Zappa, it was John Denver. If you've lost John Denver, for crying out loud, uh, defending Rocky Mountain High in, the, in Congress, then there's something wrong with you. Uh, to this day, our, you know, the successor of the Twilight Struggle against communism, one supposes is the fight against Islamic radicalism, and we have um, B-level uh, performance artists like Dinesh D'Souza writing books about the enemy at home in which the cultural left is responsible uh, for 9-11. The uh, great irony of these censorious anti-totalitarians, of course, is that they don't recognize the extent to which the music that they despise helped fight and win the systems that they hate. Um, as uh, many of you who've seen uh, Tom Stoppard's rock and roll uh, play, which is great, I recommend it to everybody, are uh, aware of these filthy hippies here are as responsible, uh, certainly uh, uh, as anyone in this room, uh, uh, for uh, stopping communism as we know it. Uh, the story goes like this in the canned version. In 1968, there was a junkie sadomistic, sadomasochistic band in New York called the Velvet Underground who were super great, although no one knew it at the time, and their cassette made it their way to Czechoslovakia in Prague, which had a brief cultural opening at the moment called the Prague Spring. These guys got a hold of it, thought, wow, that's great. Also got some Frank Zappa. They started a band that played a bunch of VU covers called the Plastic People of the Universe. As communist dictatorial totalitarians tend to do, all this stuff was illegal. They hauled these guys up for arrest in 1976 for disturbing the peace, hooliganism, and I think even for having long hair at some point. And this sparked a backlash. The playwright Václav Havel reacted to this as the final uh, uh, a line in the sand of what uh, the government that he hated did, and he started an organization called Charter 77 to combat it, um, specifically. Charter 77 uh, is a great example of uh, what we talk about all throughout the second uh, part of the book of democratization. In this case, Havel democratized dissent. He used a tool uh, and allowed everyone else to use a, a self-replicating system to fight governments. The, the idea was ingenious. Hey, government, um, you have this constitution and you're signed onto these international treaties. Live up to it. Signed everybody. 
um, or at least everybody who's brave enough to sign the document. That has since, it spread like wildfire in the East Bloc, in Poland, in the Soviet Union, elsewhere. Uh, it provided the intellectual backdrop to the dismantling of communism and the building of new regimes. And it's not just that. It's also proved to be replicated in places like China, which has the Charter 08 movement, in Cuba, which has the Varela Project, all throughout the post-Soviet near abroad, and significantly in the Arab Spring. Um, here you have a, a, a great Egypt metal uh, poster. It's a, a festival that a bunch of crazy metal and rap kids are thrown, thrown together um, who have also faced a lot of arrest uh, in, in uh, the Arab world. Uh, in uh, Egypt, there was an Alexandria Declaration that was patterned very much against uh, with uh, Charter 77 telling governments to live up to their own promises and undergirded by an appreciation for free, spree, free speech and free expression. Uh, three lessons worth pod pondering here with all this stuff. First, would-be censors in the West should be forever ashamed of themselves, just full stop. Uh, two, freedom of expression, as Havel and many of these other people understood intrinsically uh, is, uh, it can't happen in a place where the government controls the means of economic production. And three, popular culture takes on especially radical power in life of its own once it escapes the person who made it. Uh, especially pop music, youth-oriented culture is, is inherently anti-authoritarian, inherently individualistic, inherently radical. And Nick's going to talk a little bit more about culture as we go forward. Uh, this is a, uh, a picture from uh, of the cast or some of the characters in X Men First Class, the latest X Men movie that's done well. And uh, we talk about uh, we have a chapter in the book called "The Rise of the Mutants," uh, and the idea is actually that we're in an age. You know, there's no question at the uh, you know at the federal level, at the state level, at the local level. In many ways, government is more overbearing and burdensome than ever. But in our personal lives, we're actually able to uh, individualize and reconfigure ourselves like the mutants and the X-Men, uh, and that this is an enormous source of power, and it's because we are, for a variety of technological reasons, for a variety of cultural reasons, a lot of gatekeeper institutions have broken down, so we can experiment, we can innovate. Uh, the uh, anthropologist Grant McCracken has talked about this as what he calls plenitude, uh, the quickening speciation of social types in North America and most of the developed world, and in, in embryonic form uh, throughout the developing world as well, where it's uh, people are more like, um, you know, uh, we, uh, they're uh, more like Tiger Woods than not, and uh, not the sex addiction part, although, you know, if you have that, there are ways to, you know, get help for that. Uh, but uh, when Tiger Woods became big in the uh, mid-90s, he called himself a Cablanasian, uh, which was short for saying that he was, he was mixed race. Uh, he was Caucasian, black, Indian, as well as Asian. And that was his neologism to talk about a new reality, which we all kind of participate in, um, that we are hybrids, that we're mongrels, that we're interested in exploring and trying out different types of things. And this is not just, uh, you know, that we get to dress up like Halloween all the time. Uh, it's, it, it's had a profound impact and shift on, our, uh, on everyday life. When you look at the uh, show uh, Mad Men, which is hugely popular, primarily because it, it covers a period, be, a beat or two before where we are today. It's a much more regimented world, a much more gender-bound and class-bound and rule-bound world that's starting to give way in the 60s uh, and really came online more fully in the 70s as a, as a place of freedom. But we, uh, we talk about the disorganization man and woman. The workplace is not the same as it was. Uh, you know, every day, even at Cato, even with the dress code, it's more like casual Friday. Uh, than it was certainly in the mid '60s. I don't think anybody does. Anybody at Cato, David, wear starch shirts anymore? Or I think Joey Kuhn may. Okay, well there, <laughs> but it's a choice, right? It's not a. Uh, it's not a dictate. So, uh, you know, so things are different. And one of the ways uh, to think about this new social reality, which you can you can look at in terms of individual. Uh, identity. You can look at the way in the, the ways in which the workplace has opened up, and a thousand flowers are blooming, and lifestyle situations. You name it everywhere and online and whatnot. Uh, we like to talk about it in terms of pop tarts. Pop tarts were created in the mid or uh, 
introduced by Kellogg's in the uh, mid-60s, and they originally came in three flavors that looked identical from the outside, uh, blueberry, strawberry, and brown sugar cinnamon. And now you can get something like three dozen uh, Pop-Tart varieties that are all different looking on the outside. They even taste uh, somewhat differently. I'm assured uh, uh, Pop-Tarts, uh, they're recently uh, in, in um, Times Square, there's a uh, Pop Mart, Pop-Tart store that opened up where you can uh, use something called the Varietizer to come up with whatever personalized type of Pop-Tart you want. And uh, that particularly strange uh, apparition in the bottom of the slide is something they served at the store's opening, which uh, they claimed was Pop-Tart Sushi. Uh, which uh, Lord knows what that is, but uh, you know it's uh, you know it's the freedom to innovate and to fail that uh, propels us into the future. But the pop tart, you know, think of it this way: I mean, we are a much more interesting, colorful, diverse world, not just in terms of what we look like and what we sound like, but where we work and how we work and the type of work that we do. Uh, and then also in the types of situations we find ourselves in, the type of worlds we live in, the creation of cyberspace and its slow settling is, is a remarkable thing. And uh, what we're going to uh, talk about now, with that as a backdrop, we are going to uh, talk about how these trends, the, uh, the kind of end of uh, party affiliation as a primary identity, as well as this growth of plenitude, of speciation across all of our activity plays out, or hopefully will play out over the next few years. So our, uh, our subtitle for this section is really, uh, you know, why is it different this time? I can see uh, some old-time libertarians uh, in the audience, and uh, you probably remember stories going back at least to the early 70s about how libertarianism was on the cusp. We're like, uh, you know, Don Dawkins band, this, is gonna, this next album is going to really make us into a big act. Um, uh, but... Why is it different this time? And there's a couple of reasons. One, as we've discussed, brands are on the run. Uh, Republicans, everybody knows that Republicans aren't for limited government or unshackled free enterprise. If anything, uh, you know, they've proven, uh, certainly in the past uh, decade, that they are uh, the, almost the exact opposite of that. Democrats have also gone out of, uh, you know, they've uh, really uh, done a great job of showing that they don't care about civil liberties or limiting war or ending the drug war or even being particularly uh, uniform in terms of expanding uh, the rights of gays to marry. Uh, it was fascinating to see Barack Obama, a liberal hero, hemming and hawing on the eve of the vote in New York City, uh, New York State, about whether or not it would be okay for gays to marry or not. And even now he's kind of hemming and hawing about that. And the gay marriage vote in New York was because of a strange kind of uh, coalition between a bunch of libertarian-leaning Republican donors and uh, somebody like Andrew Cuomo, uh, the Democratic governor. But Americans are, were done with brand loyalty, period. And this is a problem for the Republicans and the Democrats. Uh, we don't, we're not GM families anymore or Ford families or Plymouth families. Uh, you know, thank God Plymouth no longer exists uh, and neither does Oldsmobile, but we've, we've shifted there. More to the point, uh, we are in a day of reckoning. We are not simply out of money. We're so out of money that we might actually have to make some decisions. Who knows, the uh, U.S. Uh, government may even pass a budget one of these years. Uh, we haven't had one in uh, something like uh, uh, over uh, almost two years, and uh, it's, it's looking shaky that we'll have one before the 2012 presidential election. But federal deficits under Obama's best-case scenario in his budget plan that he released earlier this spring, every year we'll have, over the next five years, we'll have a deficit that is bigger than any incurred under George Bush. That's the best case scenario. This is uh, you know, not just fiscally bankrupt, it is intellectually bankrupt and people are pulling away from it. State shortfalls and municipal shortfalls are equally drastic. And in this, uh, you know, this is the good news because it does mean that government is going to have to give something up. They're gonna have to stop doing certain things or at least the opportunity is there to really change things. 
And one of the reasons for that is that unlike, in, say, in the early 70s, we have a set of proven policy alternatives to address problems that everybody knows are completely unsustainable. Uh, this is a chart that was put together by Veronique de Rougy, who was, uh, worked at Cato as a columnist at Reason, and it has certainly helped my thought uh, quite a bit over the past few years and has contributed massively to uh, both Matt and my's, uh, to, to the book. Um, and she's uh, using data here from uh, Andrew Colson of Cato Institute. But, uh, the blue line that uh, goes up pretty nicely is the cost that it takes to educate a kid from kindergarten to the end of high school. Those flat and sometimes decreasing lines on the bottom are how high school seniors actually do over time. So we're essentially paying more than two times as much in real money to educate kids that are equally dumb now. Uh, and it's not just that, which is shocking enough, but we in fact know that we can, we can work around this. We have charter schools which didn't even open their doors officially until 1997. Magnet programs have shifted out of a kind of top-down model into something closer to a voucher problem. People are going online to educate themselves and their children or they're opting out of school altogether and doing homeschooling. Uh, the education monopoly is breaking down because we have proven alternatives that people are willing to try, and even large districts are starting to talk about backpack funding. Something is also true of the other major areas that government still controls or directly regulates, such as health care and entitlement spending. This is a moment where things are about to change. And more to the point, it's not just that we have proven policy alternatives that were out of money and nobody really seriously wants to be considered a Democrat or a Republican. You know, in the book we mention that if, uh, you know, your choices are limited to uh, Nancy Pelosi or John Boehner, the survivors will envy the dead. And, uh, you know, I think we all, you know, even hardcore Republicans, they can't get behind a single presidential candidate because they're all misfits on some level. Uh, but uh, beyond all of this, we also have different ways of working uh, mojo in the political process, which Matt is going to talk about. Um, Nick uh, sort of posed the question, how is it different this time? The long sweep, as we mentioned earlier from 1970, is that independents are the only growth market in, um, in politics. Uh, there was a previous peak before this one, um, which wasn't as high or as close to as high, and that came in the early... 1990s. That peak was uh, tied in with the rise of the Reform Party movement and specifically uh, Ross Pro ears chart uh, guy. Uh, it couldn't be more different than what we have right now. Uh, the most uh, single biggest sort of factor probably in the growth of independence in the last few years has probably been the Tea Party movement. Um, it doesn't have a leader. There isn't a single person that it's tied up with. This tracks with everything else that's happening in our economy and our life, but it's really truly a grassroots uh, uh, bottom-up movement, which is why I think it's going to last uh, uh, a lot longer. It's not just a matter of a political coalition growing. It's also a matter of the tactics uh, that people are learning from. It's now, my contention is, uh, next to impossible to suppress an important, sizable American political tendency for very long in this country, period. Um, if, especially if it is a tendency that is identified with one of the two major parties. We've seen in the last 10 years, increasingly, almost every two years at this point, there is suddenly appears out of nowhere a sizable, very angry and motivated block of people, including people who haven't been part of the political process. And my, isn't it strange how granny can use the internet now in ways that even seasoned political professionals uh, do not. Interesting thing to do to compare uh, the Howard Dean anti-war movement of 2004 to the Tea Party movement now. Um, Dean, believe it or not, was portrayed as a crazy man. I can't figure out why um, uh, when he came in. He was, uh, and actually one of the reasons why, besides the fact that he tended to look and talk and act like that, was that he was the first major politician to, in, under Bush, in Bush's America to campaign and stake himself as anti-war at a time when the country was going through a pretty pro-war, pro-interventionist 
foreign policy and, frankly, semi-jingoistic spasm. Um, he came out against that, and suddenly he had available to him using the tactics of online, using all the stuff that we've learned in the other parts of our lives, um, he could tap into this overnight, and it took the American political system by a brief storm. He didn't win the nomination, but he changed the politics. The Democrats were very clever about what to do with that just to say they just co-opted him. They uh, named him the uh, head, or he ran for and won, uh, head of the Democratic National uh, Committee. Uh, a lot of the anti-war movement immediately adhered inside the Democratic Party uh, power structure. MoveOn.org was right there. And then they all transferred very nicely to the anti-war candidate named Barack Obama. Um, that obviously worked out very, very well for Barack Obama. Uh, and uh, needless to say, the anti-war left having been subsumed by one of the ma two major parties, which, like any party that once again gains power, is not interested in what it campaigned on, if that uh, you know, forces you to change uh, Washington policy, they took them for granted, and now the anti-war left does not exist. Well, fast forward to the Tea Party movement. Um, Tea Party movement is probably even, if anything, more like right of center or more Republicanoid, maybe, of its membership than the uh, Howard Dean anti-war left was. However, they have been conscious from the beginning of stressing independence from the Republican Party. Nick, uh, especially, and a lot of people at Reason TV have been covering any time there's a Tea Party flavored rally in Washington. And it's fascinating to watch. We always sort of stick a camera in their face and say, you know, how many of you are Democrats? And like, there's a couple of sad people in the corner and like this. Uh, how many of you are or were Republicans? And there's just like a, you know, slightly embarrassed this. And how many of you are independents? And it's like, yeah. People are super keyed in to uh, I'm criticizing George W. Bush, granted it was a little bit too late, uh, at, these, uh, at these rallies, and understanding that independence is key. What did the Tea Party do? Um, most of our commentary and, and discussion of public policy is dominated by people who have a stake in one party or the other. So they have uh, identified, and I think misconstrued, the Tea Party as uh, as crazy and ineffectual because occasionally they will nominate or back a crazy person um, for office instead of a Republican who can win. They have said to the Republican Party on multiple occasions, we would rather have someone who has no chance of winning and knowing that that seat could go to a Democrat then rubber stamp another person who's going to be totally useless on TARP, bailouts, Medicare Part D, campaign finance reform, and a host of other things. Actually, they're not talking about campaign finance reform in the Tea Party. One of their great strengths is message discipline. It's about spending, and it's about the Constitution, and it really isn't about all that much more, usually. Um, that we argue, is where the future is at in politics right now. Once you can no longer be taken for granted, you have more power. The Tea Party inflicted some actual uh, change on the constitution or the composition of the Republican Party in 2010. And I think this is the first year in a hell of a long time that we've heard such crazy things as new Republican politicians on Capitol Hill talking about cutting defense. And even though the Tea Party doesn't talk about defense all that much and is probably divided on it, the single-minded focus on spending is producing candidates like a Rand Paul, like a Mike Lee, uh, like a lot of the, uh, the freshman class who are willing to take things on. So question is, where do you go from here? Um, I think the obvious next step is for people on the left, Democrats, who have been affiliating or thinking that if you just vote for the right top dog, you're going to see uh, uh, policies that you like. Uh, I think there's a, an, an education, a learning curve there. They're not only learning from the fact that Obama has been terrible on transparency on many civil liberties, specifically on the drug war and on war in general. Um, they're also seeing that the Tea Party is successful by maintaining this kind of independence. The Just Say Now campaign, this is a new thing. There's a lot of drug legalization groups that many of you are familiar in or take part in. This is a semi-new one that came out, I think, last year, uh, launched by Jane Hampshire of Fire Dog Lake, who is a total progressive. You know, She wants single-payer health insurance and all that, but she also has an independent streak and takes civil liberties pretty seriously, at least the ones that she agrees with. Uh, and, uh, and she launched this campaign uh, along with Proposition 19 in California. But part of it, there's an open, heavy flirtation with 
Republicans like Gary Johnson, who I think sits on the board of Just Say Now uh, as we speak, they understand that if they go to the Democratic Party and say, look, there's going to be full legalization on the ballot in 2012 in California, maybe Nevada, maybe Colorado, um, that's going to bring out voters who should be Democratic, because unfortunately, people assume that, uh, you know, being against the drug war means that you're more likely to be Democratic. Um, so you need to be good on this issue, or else we're going to go Republican, or we're going to go independent. Um, if you look at all of the progress made on the drug war in the last 15 years, name any of it that has anything to do with the politician. It doesn't. It's individual people using technology, using online swarms and the initiative process to create a, first a medical marijuana movement, and now we're starting to kick through the front door and demanding freedom in, through the front. So kind of a summary statement, we're all learning the technologies as we go of freedom and political change. We're learning to use this stuff to our advantage to make the dwindling power structures of the parties more responsive uh, to what we want. Um, and we're living at a time when there really is an almost unprecedented gap, I think, between the American public and its policymakers. And that is an interesting, very fluid time. There have been solid majorities against bailout economics and all facets of them now, basically since they shoved TARP down our throats way back when. Uh, at some point, slowly, the politicians are, are beginning to realize that. And the people on the other side who are changing the conversation are realizing that they're getting more power in their hands, not by supporting the politicians, but by opposing them. Um, so with that, you know, the book is a, is a gesture to speed up this process as we go along, to break the spell uh, of, uh, of tribalism, uh, if you will, and to encourage people to look at some other ideas, ideas that are perfectly in sync with the long sweep that we've had this last 40 years, where everything is going from the centralizers, from the, uh, the, the, the kind of statists in the middle, to the individual. Politics has to go that way. It'll go there last. Uh, you know, it's, it's not going to happen tomorrow, but it has to go in that direction because humans demand it ultimately to have more control over their universe. And that's the uh, final uh, kind of note of why we're optimistic is that when you recognize that politics is the lagging indicator of American society, it's, it's not where the society is headed, it gets dragged into the future. And this is true uh, when you're talking about social issues, it's true when you're talking about economic issues. And we have gone into a world now where we simply won't put up given the richness and the diversity, a true diversity of our, of our non-political lives, we're not, going to stand, uh, we're not going to stand pat for the status quo when it comes to politics. And with that, we're going to run our credits, and then we'll uh, take some questions, I guess. Let's open this up to questions. Please wait for a microphone to be brought to you so everybody can hear you, and we can start right here. Uh, thank you for an elegantly written book. There are more pop cult allusions on every page than I get in a whole year of watching Comedy Central, and they're funnier, too. As a small L libertarian capital de Democrat, I feel your pain about the total failure of the two-party system to give us good governance. But if we all declare our independence... What kind of institution is going to be left to aggregate the interests of 308 million of us? And more particularly, who's going to do the dirty work of organizing the choices? Because in a representative democracy, it comes down to a yes or no vote. Are we all going to sit at our iPads when the big speaker in the sky calls for the yeas and the nays on legalization of drugs or deregulation of cosmetology? God, I hope so. I mean... <laughs> The, we'd win that vote. But. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, one of the things in the book, uh, we, we're not saying that the Democrats and Republicans are going away. Uh, they're still going to be around. And, there's, you know, we have a two-party system historically, and that's going to continue forever and ever. Amen. Sorry about that. But, uh, you know, they'll still be there. But the question is the accountability. I mean, you know, uh, Macy's still exists, and it, it wiped out its uh, big com competitor, Gimbel's. 
at some point. But Macy's is a very different store than it was 50 or 60 years ago, and it's much more responsive to consumer need, and it recognizes that in order to stay big, it's really got to be responsive. So hopefully uh, that's what we can push the, the Democrats and Republicans to become more so. Right here. Thank you. Is it on? Yeah, yeah, there we go. Uh, following up on that, you know, I've been very discouraged of late, and, and my concern, uh, I'm glad to hear you're optimistic, is that as in everything else in the world, there's that four or five percent that are the vanguard that move things along, but you're dragging 80 percent along that, quite frankly, seem terribly disengaged these days and really disinterested in the process. So how do we reach that 80 percent? Well, first of all, I don't think that uh, disengagement from the political process is a negative thing, necessarily. I mean, it's a it is a rational response to a, an irrational and, frankly, kind of soul-killing world. Uh, you, the, we talk about it in the intro of the book, the, in the, pre, the uh, Declaration of Independence itself, they don't talk about life, liberty, and the pursuit of politics or the pursuit of watching the thrill of Chris Matthews' leg. They talk about the pursuit of happiness, and they didn't identify happiness as something that was a participation in politics. So I take that as a sign of health. Um, because it, the stale theatrics of two-party politics is a pretty ugly game, and, and there's an ugliness behind it. I mean, it's how can we get a majority of a small group of people who voted to then impose their will on the minority who didn't agree um, and, you know, sop up all their money and spit it out that way? Uh, there is an ugliness. Um, all that said, I think that it, it isn't, we're not talking about a 5% vanguard anymore. Uh, we just got in the polling business. Uh, recently at Reason, and our first poll, we sort of asked people, what do you think about the debt and the deficit? Is it a problem? Is it important? And something like 96% said it's either important or really important. And when we asked, uh, would you be in favor, for instance, which I am not, by the way, of a balanced budget amendment, 74% said yes. So there's a real actual radicalism out there. And also the, uh, and David could actually speak to this uh, better than we can, but uh, depending on how you look and measure uh, either sort of uh, libertarians or, or better stated, um, you know, fiscal conservative and socially tolerant block. That group can be as high as 59%, uh, according to some measures. Um, a lot of libertarians, and this is one of the fascinating things about their work, do not self-identify or maybe have never heard the word libertarian, which is pretty interesting. Um, so I think that the ideas actually have more resonance right now in the body politic than they have in a long time. And, and one reason why I'm optimistic I did an interview with Wisconsin Public Radio in like October of 2008 or November or something. In the middle of like bailout season, we're going to bail out the uh, automakers and everybody else. It was Wisconsin Public Radio, all right? This is Madison. And I, we took calls for an hour, and I was expecting to get just hammered on there. And every single person agreed with me. They're like, yeah, we, sh we, sh uh, we shouldn't bail out these people. They, they knew what was going on. You know, they're super polite. But they, they had some instinctive understanding of capitalism and fairness, which involved letting people who took risks fail. Uh, so I think it's a little bit in our DNA, so I am optimistic. But I'm yeah. also from California. So. Uh, which uh, means he's broke, by the <laughs> way. But, uh, no, but, you know, the battle has been joined. And when you think about that, something like the Tea Party, which, you know, we're, of, uh, we're ambivalent towards in many ways. But, you know, when's the last time, and I'll give you the answer, which is never, that you saw a national movement based on stopping government spending? that can turn hundreds of thousands of people out into the streets, that can deliver you know, 80 or 90 new congressmen. Nobody was voting for the Republicans. They were voting against the status quo. So the battle has been joined. There's a lot of work to do, and it's going to be hard to convince people that, uh, you know, who are somewhere towards the end of the line that Medicare and Social Security and defense spending has not, you know, needs to be drastically cut. But we're getting there. Yes, right there. Noticed that the uh, intro and outro of your fancy high tech presentation was California Uber Alice by the Dead Kennedys. Uh, and there's even more Dead Kennedys now than when that song was written, so it's <laughs> another sign of progress. <laughs> Thanks for that delightfully Gillespie like inappropriate uh, joke. 
Uh, punk rock was an independent music form that uh, folks our age uh, found appealing, perhaps. Uh, is there, are there things going on in popular culture nowadays that are similarly independent that are going to foster upcoming generations of people who will also think in politically independent ways? Aren't we too old to answer that question? <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> Uh, I mean, yeah, of course. There's, I, 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 again, I think that all pop culture, as banal as it is, and as much as we don't understand it after we cross a certain threshold of of, uh, of age, is inherently taking people out of their situations and addressing their concerns on some individual level. Not to overthink it too much, but I mean, rock music is about being pissed off at your parents and being anguished about the girl uh, and like wanting to go to the big city. Um, there's none of that which really, uh, you know, equates with a Taliban like lifestyle. Um, uh, we have a, a piece in our uh, current issue by Shika Dalmi is talking about Bollywood, uh, which is a fascinating idea. She argues that Bollywood has more impact on the Muslim world and on the, you know, the twilight struggle against Islamic fundamentalism than uh, U.S. foreign policy on some level because the culture there resonates much more. It's, it has more kind of traditional concerns, a lot of same geography, other kinds of things. Uh, and and it is huge in Pakistan. People have Bollywood weddings now that it's legal, which it's only been for the last three years. The Muslim world is the third biggest market for the stuff. Uh, so culture out there is just activating constantly in ways that you know you can fleetingly grasp yourself when you're maybe in your 20s or your teens. But I have full confidence that it's it's going full steam ahead. Yeah, no, actually, I've been mean, thinking about punk, for those of you who uh, are interested in that, it actually started out as a major label phenomenon. I mean, it was not coming from small labels, uh, you know, and then it was the second wave where uh, uh, companies like SST and Slash were able to do it because the technology had changed and the marketing, and it's so much better now where you don't even, you don't need a label. You don't need a a, a record producing plant. You don't need anything really to uh, you know to get your stuff out there. So things are more decentralized than ever in terms of cultural production and consumption. And I think that implies a, uh, a political independence as well. Okay, over there in the front row of the balcony. JBO. And then Zach, you can hand it to the back row of the thank, orchestra. Thank you. You answered a bit, Matt. Uh, I was going to ask, how is this in the international field? Is the rest of the world doing the, coming our way like you're talking, or are they blocking it, or how do you see this in, in Europe, in Asia? I think in the long sweep, maybe more than particularly the last five years, which have been kind of rough, but if you measure it in terms of the last 20, uh, they're moving a hell of a lot faster than we are, right? I mean... First of all, you have a half billion people coming out of poverty in the last five years. That's kind of significant. <laughs> you know, the people who are supposed to be starving to death and eating their own children uh, are now inspiring really vapid Tom Friedman books. So uh, we're 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 getting somewhere. Uh, and again, in, in all of these uh, situations, I mean, look at the Arab Spring, which the outcome is completely muddled, and who knows what the hell's going on. Uh, but that was not a movement, as far as, as I can tell, that was whipped up by Hamas, you know? There's a lot of people like metalheads in Egypt, like, like clerics, like liberal reformers, who were talking a lot about free speech. I mean, uh, as just a bedrock, let us have a freedom of religion and speech and these kinds of things. Uh, and it spoke to people on, I mean, it was a Facebook revolution, as John McCain famously complained that, you know, Mark Zuckerberg is more popular in Egypt than Barack Obama. And he said it as if that was a bad thing. Um, uh, I, th I think people are embracing technology in these places and using technology as a wedge against their authoritarian rulers and, uh, and time is on their side, not, uh, not the bad guy's side. The argument that brands are out, particularly Republicans and Democrats, uh, but what about the libertarian brand? Is part of the thesis of the book that we should reclaim that brand, there's more traction to it, or that libertarians should seize the independent brand? Oh, that's an uh, interesting uh, 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 question, David. And of course, we when we talk about libertarians, we're talking with uh, small l. Um, and I think that there's unquestionably the libertarian brand, or, or as an adjective and as a self-descriptor, seems to be on the rise. This is not something that is easy to quantify, but you just seem to see it, or maybe we're looking for it more 
it's an actual alternative because we know that conservative and liberal really are pretty tired brands. I mean, they are the Plymouth and Oldsmobiles of of the political process. I mean, they're they're out of production, and they just you know they don't know that quite yet. I do think that it is worth uh, you know cl- it's always worth claiming the libertarian brand uh, in the sense that if you believe in free minds and free markets, if you believe in a uh, you know a kind of uh, that pluralism and tolerance is. The, is is a good thing, and that laissez-faire across the board is should be your default setting. This is a great time to be claiming it because very few people actually buy the line that the reason why we had a housing crisis is because things were deregulated. I mean, the talking heads want to talk about that, but I don't. You know, I know very few people who really buy that, and I think uh, by the same token, people are ready to admit. You know that you know we're adult enough where we you know we know that the the big guys are going to screw it up, so we are ready to take responsibility for our own lives. Just sort of a, a twist on that: uh, the book is not really a voter guide or here's how you should behave. Uh, we offer kind of libertarian esque solutions in the in the last uh, part of the book, especially on the big thorny problems of entitlements and education, uh, and to a degree foreign policy and some things. But but it's more. Uh, Reason has always been an outreach uh, magazine, right? There was a there was a uh, uh, internal discussion, like in 1971, like we can either be the newsletter for the Libertarian Party, or we can try to talk to people who've never heard the word and probably think that they're crazy. And we chose the latter. Um, and the book is is written in that spirit. We're kind of talking to independents or people who are sort of fed up. Um, uh, and instead of imposing our specific definition of libertarianism, which, you know, Nick and I probably wouldn't be able to agree on one. Uh, anyways, it's, uh, it's, it's more talking about where you go with that impulse, uh, if you prefer uh, choice over control, and if you, just, if you want things to go towards the individual, uh, what's the next step after that? Uh, as a follow-up on that last question, uh, in addressing the end of brands uh, in light of the fact that you think that the Republican and Democratic parties are going to go on forever and ever and ever, uh, do you think that there is anything that can be done on the front of electoral reform uh, to change that fact, to make third parties more viable, uh, to make independent candidates more viable so that you can start to break into that duopoly? Uh, you know, I uh, would support any and all kinds of uh, you know ballot access reforms. I think that would be great. But um, to be honest, and Matt may have a, a different take, I you know I dislike partisan or electoral politics so much that I have trouble really thinking that that's where the future is. Because I you know, and I and it, I think it's a tragic comic reality that we pretty much have the government that we wanted. And you know we need to request a different type of government, and whether it's done through a, a third party or independent candidates who oftentimes do toss elections one way or the other. One of the things we talk about in the book is how uh, conservatives, in particular, were very upset that Libertarian Party candidates had screwed over. You know that's why Maria Cantwell, who is you know obviously you know more evil than Hitler, got into the Senate because uh, in Washington State, or that John Thune, uh, you know that great liber- Libertarian patriot, was voted out in South Dakota. You know this happens, and it will happen with more frequency as votes get closer and closer and things like that. But in the end. Uh, you know, we are really talking about more pre-political or pre-partisan impulses, and that's where things come from. And it's not true necessarily to say that brands are dead, but brand loyalty is dead, because in many ways brands matter a lot, but you need, the brand needs to be constantly refreshed and living and responsive. So it's a little bit of a different uh, take. I, I hope that it happens, and I have no faith that it will. I mean, unfortunately, all third party and ballot access stuff is really literally controlled by the parties. Uh, they write their own rules. You know, um, it, what we're talking about is happening in the rest of the economy. It's battering everything that we look at. You know, newspaper companies that that were seriously just like money printing machines uh, up until even five years ago. Uh, 
making uh, the kinds of profit margins that Walmart has never dreamed of, for example, it's kind of over for them right now. Um, it thinks, but the difference between them and the political parties is that the political parties and politicians have a guaranteed revenue stream. You know, we can't uh, we can't just choose a completely different thing unless we all go on Patrie Fred Friedman's you know Seastead project or something. Um, so I'm afraid that'll happen last because whatever they can get their bony fingers around, they're going to. Um, and I have nothing but uh, mad respect for those who are trying to fight that. I don't think that's going to be where the most l important reforms are going to come from, but I wish them all success. You know, I talked to a political journalist last month who was actually shocked to have just discovered that the federal government pays for the nominating conventions of the Republican and Democratic parties. So sometimes I think if somebody that well informed could be unaware of that, maybe everybody else is unaware and maybe they would be outraged if they heard about it. You get back to the problem of concentrated benefits and diffuse costs. You know, there are so many things that 300 million people should be outraged about. It's hard to pick each and every one of them and get them excited about that. But maybe in an anti-establishment time, suddenly starting to talk about how we have a trillion and a half dollar deficit and we're paying $18 million to each of the major parties to put on a show, which isn't even a nominating convention anymore. Maybe somebody should start a movement to expose that. Um, it seems like the Internet's been a big, big part of this um, in liberalizing culture, especially in the developing world. How much of a threat do you see government intervention or regulation of the Internet and sort of, I, you know, the last five years, it's definitely been humanized. Uh, how much of a threat do you see that to being the continued change um, in a you know at a cultural level? I uh, you know I think it's please tell us whether you predicted the internet's invention in advance. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, we created it in our uh, in garages that were three thousand miles apart. We didn't realize we were doing it, but uh, no, I, there are definitely threats to f free speech that continue and to free expression and to cultural expression, whether it's campaign finance reform, which is better understood as the, you know, uh, disassembling of the First Amendment. Uh, the FCC is still with us, sadly, and is constantly trying to uh, get a new mission because they're really completely unnecessary on any kind of technical level. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, uh, uh, you know, kind of rejuvenated attempts to police and uh, patrol and regulate popular culture. I mean, thankfully, the Supreme Court just struck down a really ridiculous video game law in California. So, you know, all of this happens. And then in the developing world where, you know, the governments do try to maintain a kind of root level control of the Internet, it's all there and it's not going to work. And the question is, are these people going to, you know, how much of an anchor, an unsuccessful anchor are they going to try to uh, act on? And they can, they can retard things a lot or a little bit or not at all. And, uh, you know, it will always be a fight, but I do think it's fairly unstoppable. The, the right of exit, uh, you know, has, has, been, has been kind of uh, grafted into the reality in a way that was unimaginable 20 or 30 years ago. All right, do we have one more question? Last question down here. Another one on uh, campaign finance reform. I'd like to hear your comment on this too. What about ranked choice voting? I heard James T. Bennett, who was here about, I don't know, six months or a year ago, he wrote this book called Not Invited to the Party, which is the first book on constitutional campaign finance reform, ele election reform I've read, could be the, o the, the last one I'll, I'll need to read. Uh, the single vote system seems to me to lead to just having two choices. So if you can rank your choices in, in order, in, in preference, seems to be the best solution. That's, that seems a more natural approach, the way it's done in the private sector. And then you've got all these other options too, like the state level initiatives, referendums, propositions, whatever they're called. You've got um, the, the idea of recalling people before six years, for God's sakes. And you know, uh, direct issue voting, which I said. Let me say something and then I'll let you guys wrap it up. Uh, my general sense is that 
if I were a legislator and something like that came before me, I'd vote for it. I'd be happy to see some different kinds of electoral systems. I've never felt engaged enough to want to write about it, commission a paper on it or anything, because you say, well, under our current system, it finally comes down to two choices. Well, I mean, eventually it comes down to passing the bill or not. And my sense is, if you have a multi-party system, then lots of ideological groups can be represented in the parliament. If you have a two-party system, they have to work their differences out in two large coalitions. But either way, as was said earlier, as long as people are demanding these government programs and not demanding sufficient relief of the tax burden, then they're going to get these programs. And when I look at countries governed by the parliamentary system, including some that do involve lists instead of single-member districts and so on, I don't see that they're particularly governed better than the United States. Now, that could be for other reasons, but I just I haven't been moved by any of these things. So when I see instant runoff voting um, or, uh, or or the or the listing things like that, I'm like, yeah, sure, I I'd, I'd, I'd love to have that. Um, more people would probably vote for third parties with instant runoff voting. On the other hand, it would still come down in the end, in most cases, I would think, to the leading Republican and the leading Democrat or, or whatever. Now, there was an interesting race for mayor of Oakland, I think, where it took several days to determine who was the winner because they had to keep reallocating the votes. And apparently, people who had been following it were surprised at the outcome. Now, does that mean it was because of the instant runoff voting? People might learn to game that system in the way they haven't always. Anyway, that's more than I, more time than I need to spend to say it doesn't excite me very much, but I know some libertarians who like the ideas. Uh, basically what he said, uh, <laughs> and with the uh, add-ons that I love uh, the recall vote, and I've rarely had so much pleasure than when I voted to recall Gray Davis in California. And, uh, it was uh, it was delicious, um, and I again as a Westerner, I like the uh, initiative process. Although you can make a good argument that that has uh, caused a lot of problems as well uh, from a utilitarian point of view, but it's fun to have around, and it certainly is has made a difference in the drug war, which is an issue that I care about a lot. Uh, you know, one of the things to follow up. First of, all, I uh, actually would prefer to see a uh, swimsuit competition uh, if you know any candidate fails to get fifty percent of the vote. Uh, that would strike me just as telling as anything else that they're going to say uh, while getting elected. But more to the point, uh, you had mentioned campaign finance uh, reform. One of the things that's great, and this speaks to the dynamic that I think we're talking about, is that in the past decade, uh, you know, there have been horrible campaign finance reform laws passed, and each time and with each iteration, the parties actually ended up losing more and more control of the message of a given election. Uh, including through uh, Citizens United and whatnot. I mean, this is a good thing, and it shows how difficult it is to really squeeze. You know, it's like trying to pick up uh, Quicksilver. It just pushes to the end and uh, edges, and you have something very strange going on and, and something, uh, I think, quite wonderful in that sense, and that that kind of dynamic is, is happening all over the place. And it doesn't mean that the government is not, you know, metastasizing and needs to be, uh, you know, shrunk down to size. Uh, you know, it, it, it has to, but it's more likely that it will be, I think, uh, than it was even uh, 10 years ago. All right. Thank you, Matt Welch. Thank you, Nick Gillespie. Everybody go out and buy this book. Also buy Libertarianism a primer and tell me which one you like better. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everyone.